everybody. Welcome to Osteo Bites. My name is Christina Iptoma, and I am mom to Osteo Angel Dylan and Director of Scientific Programs at MIB Agents. And today on Osteo Bites, we are talking with Dr. Christian Capitini about reprogramming NK cells within the tumor microenvironment of osteosarcoma lung metastases. Thank you so much, Dr. Capitini, for joining us on Osteo Bites today. We are thrilled to have you. And also thank you to our panelist, Max, for joining us today. Max is on our junior advisory board, and he is also an osteo warrior. A little bit more about our guest today. Dr. Capitini is an associate professor and the Gene R. Finley Professor of Pediatric Hematology and Oncology. He serves as co-leader of the Developmental Therapeutics Program at the University of Wisconsin Hormone Cancer Center and is also the Director of Clinical Innovation at the Forward Bio Institute. He leads an NIH-supported lab focused on developing cell-based immunotherapies, including natural killer cells and CAR T cells for the treatment of pediatric solid tumors. The Capitini Lab also develops alternatively activated macrophages for complications of bone marrow transplants, including graft versus host disease and acute radiation syndrome. Dr. Capitini was one of the uh, site principal investigators for the first multi-center CD19 CAR T cell trial, which led the FDA approval of tisogen uh, like Luzol T. Kimraya for relapsed refractory B cell leukemia. And currently, he is site PI for a Kimraya trial related to the upfront treatment of high risk B cell leukemia and for a multi center GD2 CAR T cell trial for neuroblastoma and osteosarcoma through the Pediatric NCI Cancer Immunotherapy Trials Network. And he's also a sponsor and PI for a University of Wisconsin clinical trial expanding gamma delta T cells in vivo using Zolodrate after alpha-beta T-cell depleted stem cell transplant. Dr. Capitini has received many awards for his clinical and research contributions, including the Department of Pediatrics Gerard B. Odell Research Award, the Outstanding New Member Science Award from the Society for Pediatric Research, and the Janet Rowley Award from the Jonas Center Cellular Therapy Symposium at the University of Chicago. And nationally, Dr. Capitini is an active member of the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer, SITSI, and serves as at-large director. And additionally, he serves on the executive board for the Pediatric Real World CAR T Consortium. And we are so pleased to have him with us today. Thank you so much. Um, please feel free to add any questions you have for Dr. Capitini to the Q&A as we go. Um, and before we get started, just a couple of announcements. There is still time to register for our Factor Conference, June 22nd to 24th in Atlanta. Um, but our hotel room block off, uh, block cutoff is May 31st. So I definitely got to get on that soon because we are um, actually tracking to sell out this year. Um, for our scientific sessions, we have six panels covering topics like biomarkers for risk stratification, preclinical models, comparative oncology, local control, immunotherapies, and molecularly targeted therapies. We have three interactive discussion groups this year on comparative oncology, computational biology, and patient-powered research. And then, in addition to our science track, we also have a wellness track, um, which includes, um, for our families, yoga, art, classical music creation, sound baths, flower arranging, emotional healing with and without emotional support bunnies, which I didn't realize that was an option, but apparently that is. Um, and then we are also going to have the fabulous Lori Krause, who leads our Healing Hearts Bereavement Grief Workshops. Um, she's going to be joining us at Factor, and she's going to be offering drop-in grief counseling. And um, if you can't make it to Factor, um, we do have our Healing Hearts virtual program, um, Bereavement Workshops for Parents, uh, this month through July 5th on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. And I will drop more information in the chat if you're interested in attending those or want to get more information. Um, Max, could you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, my name is Max and I'm a high school senior from Long Island. I was diagnosed with osteosarcoma in 2015 when I was 12, uh, 10 years old in my right distal femur. And since then, I've been seven years NED. Um, with MIB, I'm a junior advisory board member and I'm an ambassador agent. I've also been at Factor in the past and I've gone to mingles and outsmarting events. All right. Thank you, Christina. And thank you, everyone, for attending uh, today's lecture reprogramming NK cells within the tumor microenvironment or TME of osteosarcoma lung metastases. Um, I recognize that 
Uh, many of you may not be uh, immunology aficionados, so feel free to um, you know, interrupt during the presentation. We want to keep this informal, and I'm happy to clarify any concepts um, that I talk about. But I'll try and approach this more like a lecture than like a scientific presentation, at least as best I can. Let me just get a highlighter here. Great. So these are uh, my disclosures. So uh, all of you are familiar with this, but um, you know, metastatic osteosarcoma continues to have a very poor prognosis despite you know chemotherapy with MAP and local control with surgery. And this is just a slide showing the really marked difference uh, between localized and regional disease over five years versus having metastatic disease uh, where outcomes are about 25% survival. We know that the most common site of metastasis is in the lungs, and so this remains an area of a significant challenge for uh, researchers who study osteosarcoma. How do we manage those disease in the lungs? We can't take it all out. So I got interested in understanding why are the lungs uh, such a uh, area of interest for osteosarcoma metastases? Why don't they do go to other bones, but why? Why, why the lungs? Um, and part of the reason is uh, the recruitment of these uh, cells called macrophages, M2 macrophages. So the normal job of the macrophages in the lung um, are to um, basically act as scavengers, kind of help clean up debris, but tumors can kind of co-opt them and basically use them as bodyguards to protect themselves uh, from the immune system and protect them from being eliminated. And this picture is just showing that um, if you biopsy a primary osteosarcoma from a bone, without knowing what all these symbols are, it, there's, it's just a very rich, diverse matrix of cells, a mix of pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, obviously tumor cells, um, as well as non-immune cells like blood vessels um, and stroma cells, which are like the supporting cells. But when you biopsy the metastasis of an osteosarcoma in the lung, there's a high number of a particular cell, the macrophage, and a particular subtype, the M2, is dangerous because it makes all kinds of anti-inflammatory mediators so that when immune cells go in, they get turned off. And there have been a variety of therapeutic agents developed to target these tumor-associated macrophages osteosarcoma treatment. And this table is showing some of these here in the preclinical space. Some are in phase three studies, um, and then uh, some are in early phase trials. So there are now kind of four proposed strategies based on that premise to treat the osteosarcoma tumor microenvironment. And I'm going to review these for you. The first is to target immune checkpoints. Immune checkpoints are molecules on uh, the cells that basically control whether our immune system gets turned on or off. And one of those that's been of interest is a PDL1. So because there's a lot of macrophages, those are called antigen presenting cells. They present small fragments of proteins called peptides to our T cells, and our T cells recognize that and then are told to eliminate uh, the cancer cell. But if that little peptide is presented with this molecule called PDL1, the T cell gets turned off. And so when it engages the peptide, it doesn't eliminate it, it just ignores it. And so this, uh, these slides on the left here are basically three different survival curves showing PDL1 expression on slides of biopsies. Um, and basically showing that if a pathologist can detect PDL1 on your osteosarcoma and then look at what your survival, your survival is much worse if there's a high expression of PDL1. Similarly, if they stain for the presence of macrophages or another antigen presenting cell called a dendritic cell, if you have high numbers of macrophages or dendritic cells, you actually have a worse prognosis than if you don't. So it seems that having PDL1 is bad and having macrophages or dendritic cells in your tumor is bad. 
So the logical thing to do would be to give a therapy that blocks PDL1 from turning off your immune system. And so we in the pediatric oncology field have done that. And that's through FDA approved anti PD1 monoclonal antibodies called checkpoint inhibitors. Unfortunately, this data on the right summarizes what are called swimmer plots here the duration of uh, and type of response to the therapy. And what you see highlighted in red are osteosarcoma patients in yellow here. And you can see they do not get a very durable response with anti PD1 therapy. So even though they have high PDL1 in the tumor, blocking its receptor PD1 um, doesn't seem to really help. So that says, well, why don't we try a different strategy? So a second strategy is to, instead of blocking the receptors that turn off the immune system, let's get rid of the cells themselves that are causing the problem. And so um, this work that was uh, published last year out of Stanford in Robin E. Meisner's lab looked at combination anti-GD2 and anti-CD47 therapy. Now, the purpose of doing this is GD2 is a glycolipid that's expressed on osteosarcoma cells. And so they asked, well, if we give an antibody on this marker that's on osteosarcoma, that should have the immune system come and get rid of it. But as I mentioned in the prior slides, there's probably tricks that the tumor has evolved to turn off those cells when they show up to kill it so that they don't kill the tumor. So he combined the anti-GD2 with an anti-CD47. CD47 is a marker that basically tells scavengers like macrophages to not eat them. It's called the don't eat me signal. And so by blocking that with an antibody, the macrophage should be told to eat the cell. So the idea was if we give tumor specificity with anti-GD2 and then block a negative signal through the anti-CD47, one could theoretically reprogram these anti-inflammatory M2 macrophages to a pro-inflammatory M1 phenotype. And he showed very promising data in uh, tissue culture as well as in mice that this approach works. And that has led to a clinical trial, which is currently enrolling, testing the combination of these two antibodies in patients with relapse refractory neuroblastoma or osteosarcoma, because both of these two childhood tumors have very high levels of GD2. At our center, we don't have that study open, but we have a similar study open um, in this uh, pilot study. In this study, we're giving an anti-GD2 antibody, but tethered to it is a activating signal called IL-2, which is a, a cytokine that basically any cell that binds to the antibody would then turn it on and kind of activate it and help it to digest the tumor cell but we're not counting on the antibody called immunocytokine to do all the work. We're also collecting NK cells, natural killer cells, which are cells that are between five and 15% of the lymphocytes in our blood. And we're taking them from mom or dad as a donor so that they're half matched to the patient's tumor and combining it with this anti-GD2 immunocytokine. And the goal is to infuse a fresh a uh, product of NK cells, and then to freeze down three different uh, bags of NK cells and give them uh, in regular intervals with or without the antibody therapy. If that's tolerated by the first cohort of patients, then a subsequent cohort, all the patients will get NK cells and the antibody in combination. Let's look at another strategy. So a third is targeting immunosuppressive cytokines and molecules, or basically things floating in the environment around the osteosarcoma, but it's not attached to a cell. And then on the flip, can we increase the pro-inflammatory cytokines? So let's block the negative ones, and then is there a way that we can increase the positive ones? So... To help understand that a little better, this cartoon is showing a cluster of tumor cells, which in, for the purpose of this could be osteosarcoma, but really could be any solid tumor. As I mentioned earlier, they make the soluble uh, proteins that are called cytokines and are able to reduce immune cell proliferation. They can 
uh, reduce cytokine production by the immune cells themselves so that they can't communicate with each other well. It reduces effector molecules so that the immune cells can't kill the cell, and that results in decreased cytotoxicity. Well, one of those molecules is called TGF-beta, and TGF-beta has a negative impact on the two immune cells that are known to kill cancer cells best, the natural killer cells, or NK cells, and the T cells. But we have ways we can turn them on. One of them is a, a pro-inflammatory cytokine called IL-15. IL-15 can increase the survival of these cells, it can increase their proliferation, and it can activate them. So one of the scientific questions for today's lecture is, what if we neutralize the anti-inflammatory cytokine TGF-beta, but at the same time increase the pro-inflammatory cytokine IL-15? While doing that in combination, will that enhance an anti-tumor effect? Well, to answer that question, um, we had to create a new protein that combines the IL-15 positive, but neutralizes the TGF-beta negative. Well, that molecule is a synthetic protein called FIS15, or a fusokine, because it fused together two different molecules. So this is shown here. This is the amino acid sequence. In the N-terminal part of the amino acid sequence is what's called a decoy receptor. So this receptor binds the negative TGF-beta, but this is a receptor that can't signal. So when the TGF-beta binds to this protein, it doesn't do anything. It just gets stuck to it. So this is called a decoy or a trap. Then on this side of the amino acid sequence is the IL-15 and its receptor called the sushi domain. And the IL-15 sushi is a way to stabilize the pro-inflammatory signal and turn on the NK cells or T cells. And so we fuse this into a fusokine. And this was published work from a collaborator, uh, Jacques Gallipo at our center. And he designed this molecule, the TGF-beta trapped with the IL-15, and gave it to mice with melanoma. And basically, when he gave it to these mice, he measured the size of the tumor, and the tumors completely shrunk away. He then gave it to mice who had melanoma that were missing different cells in the immune system. And it turned out the only ones that got large tumors were mice that were missing NK cells, which means that NK cells were required for the anti-tumor effect when you give IL-15 and you block TGF-beta. So we set up an experiment, and this is all un unpublished data, where we set up a model in mice where we give osteosarcoma but ensure that it forms lung metastases. And a way to do that is to inject it into their vein. So by then it bypasses the bones and the first place it ends up is in the lungs and it gets stuck there and establishes. We used a particular osteosarcoma cell line called K7M2, which is uh, labeled with a, a luminescent marker such that we can detect it um, and quantify how much is in the lung. Now, we also combine this with a syngenaic bone marrow transplant. Now, why do we do that? We don't bone marrow transplant osteosarcoma patients. What we do do when we give cell therapy, like CAR T cells to patients, what we've learned from those uh, drugs is that you can't just inject cells and expect them to work. It turns out our body does a really good job of regulating how many cells are in our body at a given time. And so if you want to inject immune cells into a patient, you have to get rid of cells that are in the patient to make room for them. And in patients, we do that with chemotherapy. In mice, it's a little bit more tricky. So we instead can use total body irradiation. But if you give high amounts of total body radiation, it's going to get rid of not just NK cells, but all bone marrow derived cells. So we rescue them with the bone marrow transplant. And we do this for other solid tumors in children, including Ewing sarcoma, osteo, I'm sorry, Ewing sarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma sometimes. Um, auto, autologous bone marrow transplant has been used, but it's not yet been applied in osteosarcoma. But I think it's a great tool to get um, uh, cells, to create space for cells to come and mediate their effect. So we do the transplant, we inject NK cells, 
and then we give our fist 15 fusokine and see what happens. Well, I've never dosed uh, fist 15 before. So first you have to establish a curve so that you know how often to dose it. You give it every hour, you give it once a week. So we injected a healthy mouse with the FIST-15 and then measured the pro-inflammatory IL-15 in serial intervals. And you can see that it peaks about two hours after you inject it, and the animal will clear it out by 36, between 36 and 48 hours. So that led us to a dosing regimen where we would give the FIST-15 about every other day after the NK cell injection. And this is an in vivo experiment where now you can see the uh, osteosarcoma cells are able to glow, and so we can detect them. And on the left here are mice that got no treatment. And you can see on day zero, they have detectable pulmonary metastases. And by day seven, you can see that the signal increases to day 14. And by 21, um, most of the animals die of pulmonary metastases. A second group just got NK cells because, you know, they, they can eliminate tumors. And you can see at baseline, they all have pulmonary metastases, but by the end of the experiment, they too have large uh, uh, pulmonary metastases. And so NK cells alone are insufficient. But when you give NK cells with this FIS-15, so providing the positive IL-15 and taking away the negative TGF beta, you see the opposite. So now you see the pulmonary metastasis signal go away. And by 21 days, there's a small, very faint signal, but the mice are still very healthy. And so we can quantify this uh, bioluminescent signal and graph it. And you can see uh, by 21 days, it's undetectable in the NK cell FIS-15, but in the control or in the NK treated, it's at very high levels. And that leads to a survival benefit that by one month after injection, the NK cell and FIS-15 treated mice are all alive, but those treated with NK cells alone or with no treatment uh, have worse survival. And you can actually remove the lungs out of these mice. And it's hard to see here, but there's these grayish nodules. They actually form bone in the lungs. And you can count these by staining them with an India ink. And the NK FIS-15 combination treatment there are no pulmonary metastases that we can detect. Hey, Dr. Capitini, I'm curious if you were able to look at, um, you know, you're kind of comparing these three different groups, if you're able to kind of look at NK cell plus um, blocking TGF beta, and then NK cell plus uh, just stimulating IL-15 to see kind of what's doing the heavy lifting, if it's the blocking the TGF beta or the stimulating the IL-15, or is it truly just like the synergy of the two working together? Excellent question. Um, we do get at that. We have later done experiments where um, we've just given NK cells with IL-15. And in fact, the ones that I'm showing you here are, um, when we isolate them, we also um, activate them in IL-15 in, tish in tissue culture before we inject them. Um, so we know that the giving the positive signal is not enough. What we've not done, but you are completely correct, is tried by itself taking away the TGF beta. And the reason we haven't done that is um, we don't we haven't yet identified a good way to do that in isolation. There is a small molecule inhibitor that blocks TGF beta signaling that others have published helps enhance anti-tumor responses, but it's never been combined with NK cells. And so we are still trying to find the right dosing so that it doesn't impact the NK cells um, ability to do what it needs to do, if that makes sense. Thank you. We have here um, looked at uh, the tumor microenvironment in the lung by doing something called bronchoscopy. So uh, this is a, a clinical procedure where, uh, you know, in patients you'd be put to sleep, you put a tube down the trachea, your breathing tube, and um, then you're able to squirt fluid into the lung tissue and then withdraw that fluid. And that fluid becomes very valuable because you can kind of like drawing blood, but you can 
sample the fluid in the lungs and measure the number of immune cells and not just the numbers, but what properties about them make them pro or anti-inflammatory. So this was done at five days after treatment with the NK cells alone or with FIS15 or untreated, and then seven days as well. And what we found was that basically only with the combination treatment were we able to detect basically any cells in there. And when we looked at NK cells, about 30% of the cells we pull out are NK cells, which is a very high number. Because again, in the blood, they're usually between 5 and 15%. And just injecting NKs by themselves, you don't see very high amounts in the lung. So we think the FIS15 is giving them some survival advantage. Um, these are just flow plots looking at control NK and NK with FIS15 and showing that we see very little T cells in there. That's this lower right-hand corner. So between 0.3 and 2.6%. But we do see NK cells specifically in the combination group here, 24%. At day seven, we were wondering like, if we just wait a couple more days, does the number even get higher? Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case. We still see here 20% as compared to 30%. But we were able to look at some activation markers, CD69, NKG2D, and NKP46. And the only thing that really stood out was NKG2D, which is an activation receptor on NK cells. When you inject NKs by themselves, only 20% of the cells are NKG2D positive. But when you add the FIST15, about 75% of them are NKG2D positive. Um, lastly, we looked at a mechanism by which they can kill, and one of them is releasing these um, granzymes, which are enzymes that can digest the target cell. And there's only you know two mice in each one, so it's not powered to look at big differences, but the NKFIS15 had about 50% of the NK cells expressing granzyme compared to 20% of the NKs by themselves. So we think there's something there, but obviously we need to do more animals. This is uh, more supportive data, but now um, addressing the question that was just asked, what if you give individual components? So I mentioned we had done some work with just the IL-15 part. So that's this NKI group. And in the lung, there looks like there's a little increase, but it wasn't statistically significant. The only real significant increase in increasing NK cell in the lung was giving combination NK and FIS15. So because we have a group that's NK and IL-15, that means having the blockade of TGF-beta adds something here. Um, this is also looking in the fluid that we pulled out of the lung, and same thing, only the combination had a meaningful increase. And then we compared that to the spleen because in humans, that'd be the equivalent in looking in the blood. In mice, you can't get enough blood out of a blood draw to measure the NKs, but the spleen gives us a good idea. And only in the combination group do we see an increase peripherally that compares with the lung. There was a, there was a question in the chat, if you don't mind me asking. Oh. Um, uh, somebody asked, what dose of NK cells uh, are you giving and how frequently are you giving them? We give one dose of NK cells, and uh, you can see here there's 4 million. That's in comparison to 2 million uh, osteosarcoma cells. So roughly it's a 2 to 1 effector to target ratio. So it's a single infusion of NK cells, but we give multiple treatments every other day of the FIS-15. So in this experiment, we did the same thing as what I just showed you, but we purposely kill all the animals after one week and do RNA sequencing so that we can learn, like, why is this combination treatment working better? It's very complicated data. So what I'm going to summarize for you is what's called pathway analysis. So instead of, like, looking at every single gene that's expressed um, in the cells in the lung, you can cluster them together into what are called uh, pathways and see if there's relationships between the genes to see if there's any common themes that come out. The left side is showing all of the genes that are down-regulated. The most common down-regulated pathways are related to angiogenesis or blood vessel formation. So it seems one of the reasons of success 
is that the, the osteosarcoma loses the ability to metastasize. So even though these are metastases, they still have the ability to metastasize and make more of themselves. Um, but part of the way they do that is making new blood vessels to connect to each other. And that process seems to be um, attenuated. On the positive side, there's two types of pathways that go up. One are cell cycle related. And we know because the tumors are shrinking, it's not the tumor cell cycle that's going up. It must be the NK cells because I showed you in the fluid, 60% of the cells are NK versus in the control groups, um, they're only in 20% of the cells. So we think cell, NK cell proliferation is increasing and their NK cell effector genes are also increased. So it turns out there is some literature that NK cells can be pro-angiogenic, meaning they can help uh, support blood vessel formation. And it turns out they do that through TGF-beta, the exact anti-inflammatory molecule that we're blocking. The way that they do that is they TGF-beta binds to the NK cell and makes it secrete something called VEGF, or vascular um, endothelial growth factor, a growth factor that stimulates blood vessel growth. So then we looked at those genes that I just showed you and honed in on all the ones related to VEGF and its kind of sister molecules. Red means highly expressed, and you can see in untreated animals, almost every single thing we measure related to angiogenesis is super high. And that, that explains why the metastases get so big. When you give NK cells with IL-15 um, and the IL-15 receptor, you can see that you know some of the genes, there's no change. Some are still really high and some are low. But the only way to turn off this program and turn off angiogenesis is to give NK with FIS15. So giving the NK, the IL-15, but also blocking that TGF beta, and now everything goes down. So we think there's something to the combination. This is just other pathway analysis data, um, all supporting what I just showed you. Again, angiogenesis is going down. Here are 70 genes that have gone down in this pathway, 37 genes in this pathway. And then the genes that go up are related to NK cell cytotoxicity and apoptosis. And again, the software doesn't know what I injected into the, the mice, but yet these are the genes that are the most prominent. So I think that this is real and not noise. So when we dive deeper and look at the genes that the software is calling NK cell cytotoxicity, we see some familiar actors. So again, green is down and untreated. NK cytotoxicity is low. With NK Nile 15, it's a mix. But in NK FIS 15, um, almost all the cytotoxicity genes, with some few exceptions in white here, are pretty high. Branzyme, perforin, interferon, gamma. But some that stuck out include TBET, and RUNX3 and the IL-2 receptor. One other one that stuck out is this molecule called DTX1. DTX1 is a ubiquitin ligase and a regulator of the notch pathway. And it's been known to um, influence the ability of NK cells to eliminate lung cancer. So while this isn't lung cancer, it is lung metastases of an osteosarcoma. So we wanted to see if DTX1 was playing a role in RNK cells. And in fact, in the combination group shown in pink, we do see high DTX1 when we compare it to three different housekeeping genes. So DTX1 is getting turned on in our system, like what happens in lung cancer. Why is this important? Um, a study published by another group showed that DTX1 regulates thymic development of NK cells through this transcription factor called GATA3. So basically having a lot of DTX1 helps your NK cells, more of them get made and they mature and become better at killing cancer cells. And so the idea here is that maybe the FIS15 is turning on DTX1 and making our NK cells better killers and in doing so, they uh, can reduce angiogenesis. Okay, so for the last part of the talk, I wanna pivot to this GD2 that I mentioned. There's a couple of clinical trials 
uh, at our center as well as the uh, work out of Stanford targeting. So as a reminder, GD2 is a glycolipid that's overexpressed on pediatric and adult cancers, and that's shown here. Um, so there's basically a, a lipid backbone that um, over a series of enzymes has a bunch of sialic acid sugar molecules put on it. And depending how many sugar molecules you have tells you what GD number you are. So you'd be GD3, GD2, GD1, et cetera. So a whole lot of cancers are now known to overexpress GD2, but the prototype are neuroblastoma, by which the GD2 antibody dinatuximab, as well as nactimumab, are FDA approved. But similarly, osteosarcoma is very high in GD2. In fact, neuroblastoma and osteosarcoma, they're so high in GD2, we don't even test. We assume 100% of the samples are positive. Whereas for all these other cancers, they have GD2, but it's more variable expression. It can be as low as 5%, as high as 90%, but it's, you know, it's varies patient to patient. But these two are thought of to be 100% expressors. So folks have made uh, CAR T cells, not just against the blood cancers by which the FDA approved products are, but they've made them against GD2. And in fact, the first CAR T to ever work in a solid tumor was targeting the molecule GD2. But if you summarize all the studies that have been published to date and or presented at scientific meetings, the response rates are low, less than 21%. So while CAR-T is a really good treatment for ch children with leukemia, it has a long way to go for osteosarcoma. The reason the trials are failing is that the CAR-T cells don't stick around after you inject them. If they do stick around, they get exhausted. They can't form long-term memory. And possibly there's at least one trial that shows that the tumor may be losing GD2 expression on its surface. To review uh, how cars are made, all the FDA approved products use viruses to make the car. So viruses like HIV, their normal function is to infect T cells. And so scientists have engineered these viruses to infect, but not replicate, so you don't get AIDS. But you can infect cells with the CAR, which is a synthetic receptor, and then the uh, T cell expresses an ability to bind GD2, and it knows to kill any cell that has GD2. But the problem with using viruses is it's very expensive. You can't control where the virus goes in the T cell, so it could go into an oncogene and give you cancer. So you have to monitor patients for that. Um, and basically, it inserts itself randomly. So some cells could have very high expression of the CAR, some have very low. There are non-viral ways to make CARs, and one of them is called electroporation, where you apply an electrical pulse to the T cells or NK cells. And that temporary electrical pulse damages the cell and creates an electrical current and you can pass the car into the cell temporarily um, and allow it to be expressed. There are a lot of limitations to doing the viral approaches. Uh, some of those I just talked about, it's also super expensive. That's why you don't have many academic hospitals making cars um, be because they're um, tens of millions of dollars for these clinical trials. And if you can't make virus at your institution, there's a two to three year wait list at these contract manufacturing facilities to get virus to make CAR. Um, but we need these studies done now. So we've been interested in making a solid tumor CAR for osteosarcoma in a completely virus-free manner. And our plan is to make this initially in T cells because there's more data to do that. But going back to the stuff I showed you in the beginning, move it to NK cells. So how are we doing that? So that we're doing virus-free using CRISPR-Cas9. So CRISPR-Cas9, um, as you know, is a technology that allows you to edit any uh, gene uh, in the body, and you can do it in a very precise manner. And um, the technology basically involves an enzyme that's able to cut our DNA after certain sequences that it can recognize, here called the PAMP sequence. And you can guide the uh, enzyme to SNP and cut out any gene you want, but you can also knock in uh, a gene of interest. So you can cut out a bad gene and put in a good one. A good one to put in is a car. So we put in a GD2 car, uh, one that 
when it was put in with viruses did not work in clinical trials, but we think it's going to work using CRISPR. And part of the reason is based on published work by others that I don't have time to review, where you put it in matters. And so we put it into the endogenous T cell locus called TRAC. And so now the T cell can't use its own receptor, but it's forced to use the CAR receptor. And so we compared this to the retrovirus, which is the traditional way of doing it. And it's actually less efficient. You see better CAR expression with the retrovirus, but you get better knockout of the endogenous TCR because remember a virus inserts randomly, so it doesn't knock it out. But with CRISPR, we are intentionally knocking it out. So we got rid of the, the, the T cell receptor, we put in the car, and you get a more, much more homogeneous expression on the T cell, whereas with a retrovirus, some are low, some are high. But again, the car has much, the retrovirus has much higher levels of the car, which some would argue is better. We did genome-wide analysis to make sure the CRISPR isn't accidentally editing genes it's not supposed to be, and it fell into the 57th percentile. So it's not a perfect technology, but at least for the vast majority of cells, it cut where it's supposed to cut. Because we passed an electrical current in the cells, I always worry that you end up damaging or killing your car product. So we measured viability every day. And after electrocution, the viability does go down. But if you keep them nourished in culture, they actually catch up to retroviral control cells. Um, and at the end of the culture, they have the same viability which the FDA threshold is 70%, and we're right at 80%. We get about a one log increase in cells over that one week time period. So we can take a million cells and have 10 million cells at the end of the culture. And we realize that passing the electrical current, the time that you do it in the culture matters. You get much more better editing if you uh, pass it at 48 hours than at 72 hours. We then measured a whole cocktail of cytokines to make sure that the CAR T cells were functional. And across the board, the virus was better than making uh, cytokines than the CRISPR, which you would, some of you would say, that's great. Well, that's bad because when you're in culture, the CAR T cells haven't seen GD2. They haven't seen osteosarcoma. They're just growing in culture. So in fact, when they're making this much cytokine, it's bad and it's called tonic signaling. It means the car is signaling the T cell to kill when there's nothing to kill. And that's a recipe for exhaustion. That, that means it gets burned out. If we inject this green retrovirus product, which people had been using in clinical trials into patients, it's going to exhaust and it's not going to do anything. And that may be why it's not working. We're too good at manufacturing cells. The CRISPR approach is better. They still make cytokines just much lower. The cells are not exhausted when you're done making them. We proved that in this published work by measuring the cytotoxicity signal in the car. These black bands show the cytotoxicity signals really turned on with the retroviral cars, but with our CRISPR, it's a faint light gray. They're barely turned on. And again, they haven't seen the GD2 yet, so they shouldn't be turned on. We did RNA-seq, and basically you see purple and orange. Purple means memory cells, orange means exhausted cells. Our CRISPR product, you can see, has a lot of purple, a lot of potential for memory. So we put these into animals that had a GD2 positive human neuroblastoma and measured them over time. And those that um, got uh, mock treated T cells all die in two months. But the CRISPR and the retrovirus had equal control of survival, there was no statistical difference. So they're not an inferior. So the question now is, are T cells the right cells for us to be doing this? Going back to the beginning of the lecture, should we do this to NK cells? Because we know that they have activity against at least GD2 osteosarcoma. There's a lot of data show they work in neuroblastoma, but there's a lot we don't know. Virus versus non-viral, what construct. If we use CRISPR, I can't knock out a T cell receptor. NK cells don't have one. So what gene do I knock out? So currently what we're doing is trying to figure that out. We can make car in case GD2 car in case cells, but not as good as T cells. The efficiency here, you can see only 3% of the cells have the car. Whereas, you know, with viral approaches, you can get 70, 
but even though only 3% have the car, they kill really well. This is showing tumor growth over time. And you can see in the controls, the tumors get grow very high in number from about 75,000 uh, to 250,000. But only with two to 3% of the cells being positive for the car, the NKs get rid of um, the tumor really nicely. And in fact, when we look at exhaustion markers, um, they some of them go up, some have no change. Other groups have tried to use CRISPR uh, to edit NK cells. It turns out they're the hardest cells in the entire immune system. So this is showing all different, here's T cells, uh, B cells, stem cells. NK cells are the hardest ones to gene edit. There are some folks that have had success. This is a group out of Taiwan that um, were able to knock out a bunch of genes in NK cells at 90% efficiency. And when they knocked out multiple ones, they got 76%. But their knock-in rate, which is what we care about for putting a car in, was low, 4 to 7.5%. One of the genes, though, that they found was helpful to knock out was NKG2A, which is an inhibitory receptor that turns off NK cells. And so we tried to knock out NKG2A, and we did it better than they. So we were able to get up to 24% shown in the upper left here of our NK cells to be missing this receptor, whereas other groups have shown half of that. We show that the cells are viable after they're exposed to the electric pulse. And by depending on how we uh, remove the NKG2A gene, we can get up to 83% of the cells to be missing NKG2A. So we're really excited about applying a GD2 car approach in NK cells and knocking out in this inhibitory receptor. The last thing I'll show is that, you know, we're still trying to optimize this. And just like with the T cells, we found like at two days is better than at three days to do all this gene engineering. We're seeing differences, not on the knockout side, doesn't matter when you knock the genes out, the efficiency is the same. But when you go to knock in things, the day that you do it matters. So four days is way better than waiting later in the culture. So there seems to be a sweet spot where NK cells are very receptive to getting gene engineered. And part of that depends on how strong of an electrical pulse you use, because you can imagine the higher the pulse, the rougher it is on the cells, the more they die. But um, the, the flip side is your editing efficiency is the exact opposite. So weak pulses give you worse editing, strong pulses give you strong editing, but you get less viability. So we're just trying uh, different um, electro, electro currents, pulses, and times. So in summary, I've shown you that um, CRISPR-Cas9 can transduce the car to T cells without any need for virus and show functionality. We've shown that with using retroviruses, you get better car expression but the cell is, has more tonic singling and is exhausted. Non-viral CRISPR-Cas9 is more efficient at knocking out than knocking things in, but it depends at the target gene that you're knocking out. And that activation time, pulse strength, and the car all impact the CRISPR efficiency. So I'll stop there and take questions. I wanna thank folks in my lab, our collaborators at St. Jude who did the off-target analysis um, and we work very closely with the biomedical engineering group who's been pioneering all of the gene engineering work that I showed you. Um, the FIS-15 work, um, as well as uh, some of the uh, in vivo correlates are done by folks in my lab. And I'll thank our funders. I also want to thank um, Malcolm Brenner at Baylor for providing the GD2 car construct. I'll take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Capitini. Um, I think we do have a question lined up in the Q&A. Max, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, in the clinical trial with the haploidentical NK cells, anti-GD2 yeah. IL2, um, IL2 induces proliferation of regulatory T cells, immune suppressive cells, given IL2 may induce proliferation of regulatory cells which may blunt the effects of NK cells. Can you please comment on this? Incredible question. Um, the uh, 
the reason we chose the immunocytokine rather than injecting IL-2 as a drug is for that exact question you just asked. Um, we felt that if we gave it systemically, the, the, the bad cells, the regulatory T cells are going to sop it all up and blunt all of our effects. Because the IL-2 is on the antibody itself, only the cells that bind the antibody will see the IL-2 and regulatory T cells won't do that. So um, the NK cells and maybe uh, pro-inflammatory macrophages will bind to that antibody and kill and they'll get some benefit from the IL-2, but the regulatory T cells shouldn't bind the antibody. So it should be a non-issue, but it's always a concern. And it's something that we can easily study in the preclinical models. Uh, I have another question that came in. So someone asked, replacing the endogenous TCR with the CAR TCR, will it reduce the clonality of TCR and decrease the activity against infection? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it's it's it could be a concern. Um, I, I waffle on it for one reason. If 100% of your immune system was lacking a T cell receptor, there's no question that viral reactivation will be a significant problem. We know from bone marrow transplant, if you deplete your donor T cells, they have very high rates of viral infections, some of which are life-threatening. But here we're limited to the cells that we infuse, which in the beginning will make up the vast majority of the cells. But after they're done engaging the tumor, they'll contract in size and your body will still make T cells that are not gene edited. So those cells should be in place to fight viruses. But you're correct. There could be a period of time where, you know, that first month after you infuse the cells and the CAR cells are the majority of the cells in your body, that they're not able to deal with viral infections. And that's why when patients get fever after CAR infusions, they have to come to the hospital right away. In fact, we make patients uh, who don't live within uh, um, an hour of the hospital stay locally so that when they get a fever, they can be quickly come in and observed. So I think it's a very fair question and why we should proceed cautiously. But I also don't think we should abandon it because I think if we wait, the body will recover and be able to fight. Makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cavatini, you had mentioned um, earlier kind of some reasons why the CAR GD2s haven't been that effective to date, um, one being durability, um, the exhaustion, which I think are kind of addressed by the uh, by kind of some of the work you were showing with the CRISPR car. Um, but one of the other reasons you mentioned was that the tumor loses the GD2 expression on the surface. Oh, yeah. I'm wondering kind of what some strategies are to tackle that. Oh, boy. So, um, you know, I took that slide out to show time, but the group at Baylor has really nice data with um, a hybrid cell, NK T cell. It's, it's a T cell, but it has NK capacity. And when they infused patients with NKT cells with neuroblastoma targeting GD2, in one of the patients, the level of GD2 went down to the control uh, antibody stain, making them wonder, did it lose the antigen or did it downregulate it? We don't know which one of those two. So I guess the, the question you're asking is, can you make it go up? Well, as I showed you in that GD2 slide, it's all driven by an enzyme. So I don't have a, a short answer to say that we have a way to um, turn that enzyme on at will, but that would be the way to do it, would be you probably in silico to find drugs that could bind that enzyme in a, you know looking at three-dimensional modeling, and then in a trial, you know give said drug and try and drive expression in that case so that you can go after the tumor again. Um, I think it's a great idea. Another way that groups are thinking about addressing it is there's no reason a car has to bind one antigen. Like GD2 is great, but we could make GD2 plus B7H3, which is another antigen on osteosarcoma, or anything else. We can target, as I showed with the CRISPR, um, multiple genes. So we could knock in 
different cars. So you can have one car target two things, or we can put two cars in so that your NK cell kills A and B. So a lot of cool things we can do, but that'll, that'll, that should get around the down regulation because then there's no evolutionary advantage. Great. Thank you so much. Um, that was really, really interesting presentation. Really appreciate your joining us today and making it better for all osteosarcoma patients and sarcoma patients. More information on this and all osteobites can be found on the MIB Agents YouTube channel, on our website at mibagents.org, and at your favorite podcast place. And please join us next week on June 1st. We're going to be talking to Dr. Alice Saragni from UCLA. Um, she has a lab in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at UCLA, which couples basic research into mechanisms of disease to the development of novel therapeutic strategies. The lab focuses on developing tumor organoid models to investigate the biology of rare tumors and to perform screenings for precision medicine applications. And she'll be joining us to talk about osteosarcoma organoid models, the potential and limitations of personalized avatars. You can find our Osteobytes lineup for the next few months on our website. And if you have any ideas for future topics that you'd like to hear about, please share them with us at events at mibagents.org. Thank you again, Dr. Cappuccini, Max, and Walker. And for all of you joining us today, thanks for spending an hour with us. And we hope to see you next week on June 1st when we talk with Dr. Alice Zeregni. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.